morning. Man, so excited to be here at Upstate Church Malden with you guys. Like Ashley said, I'm Will. Uh, my wife, Molly, and I just love being able to worship with you here at our Malden campus. We love Ashley and Carrie like I know you guys do. Uh, I'm always just inspired and challenged by Ashley's wisdom and leadership. And I know that he cares for you guys. He and Carrie care for you guys so well. And so we love them. And guys, man, just love getting to be here and worship with y'all this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can go and turn to Isaiah chapter 9. We'll begin in verse verse 2 here in just a second, Isaiah chapter 9, we'll begin our series in the Advent in Christmas time this morning. I don't know about you guys, but I'm thankful that this time of division and debate is over in our country. I know we've kind of had just this difficult season, just a lot of disagreement. Man, Thanksgiving is over. It's officially Christmas, no matter who you are, okay? Doesn't matter when you turn Mariah Carey on. It doesn't matter when you put your tree on. It is Advent, okay? It's Christmas season now. We're here. We made it. And although we've been uh, just having an incredible time in God's word over these last few months, walking verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, man, we're excited to open up our series this morning in Advent and to really speak about, to look to God's word, to see what God has to say about the arrival of the Christ. That's actually what that word Advent really means. I don't know if you're like me. I'm like, I've never used that word in my life. You know, Christmas time is the only time you hear it. Advent really means arrival. It's the season when we celebrate the arrival of God made flesh of God become man, Jesus Christ, born as a baby in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. Advent is this season when we celebrate his arrival. Uh, My friends and I from college, we kind of have a little bit of a tradition when we're celebrating something, we just bring glass bottle root beer over. Maybe it's an engagement that's being celebrated. Maybe it's just a good football game, you know, somebody's birthday. It's just what we always did throughout college. You just bring over glass bottle root beer. And so I know what to expect. When one of those friends comes over to our house, now a lot of us are married and engaged. You know, if if that couple comes over to our house, I know what to expect. When they're coming, they're just bringing glass bottle root beer. All right, that's what to expect when they're coming. That is something like what we're doing as we walk through God's word over these next few weeks with the Advent. Advent tells us what to expect with the coming of Christ. What does Jesus bring with him when he comes? When Jesus becomes, when God, the Son of God, eternal, becomes a man is born of a virgin over 2,000 years ago at Christmas. When we celebrate the Advent, we're celebrating what does Jesus bring with him when he comes. And the text that we're about to read together this morning, it tells us that when Jesus comes, he is bringing hope. That when Jesus came over 2,000 years ago, what we're celebrating at Christmas is that Jesus brings hope. Hope is the driving belief in what is not fully here yet. Hope isn't a a passive belief, but this is so important for our time together this morning. Hope isn't a passive belief thinking that maybe if we're lucky and things turn out right, Something will go our way. Hope is a driving belief. It pushes us to action. It is a driving belief in something in which you can be certain even though it has not actually occurred yet. What we're celebrating is that at Christmas is that God in his advent, in his arrival, is bringing about hope. Let's read our text together this morning, Isaiah chapter 9, and we'll start out in verse 2. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The text that we just read is a word from God through the prophet Isaiah to the people of God in a time of exile. There's a great time of difficulty, a circumstance of great confusion for God's people. They're being conquered by the Babylonians, and they're in a time of great darkness. They're in a time of great confusion. And this passage of Scripture, this prophecy, is speaking hundreds of years into the future about one who would come and shine light into their darkness. One who would come and free them from their slavery. One who would come and break their chains. Ultimately, one who would come and bring hope into their desperate situation. One of the things that's beautiful about the Bible is that the Bible has a real meaning and it's real time to its original audience. That's what we see here. It's a prophecy from God through Isaiah to his people in a real time. These are people who really existed. But because we now have picked up the mantle as the church of the people of God, now that God has made us his people, then we can see the ways in which God's promises, his prophecies, his word speak not only to the people who they were originally spoken to in real time, but also to us thousands of years later because of what Jesus has done for us. We have this amazing circumstance where we can join with the believers who were looking ahead to hope hundreds of years in the future as we look backwards to the hope that Jesus gave us thousands of years ago. So we'll look at this passage of scripture this morning through two lenses. The first is that we all need hope. We all need hope. This passage of scripture shows us that we are all in need of hope. I don't know if you guys uh, kind of deal with this same thing, but maybe this last week you were staying over with family in an unfamiliar place. Maybe you've been in a hotel room before in an unfamiliar place. All the lights are out and you have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Or maybe you just need that warm glass of milk, okay? You just, you get ready. You've got to have that slice of cake at 3 a.m. I don't know what you're getting up in the middle of the night for, but you're in an unfamiliar place and you've got to get up in the middle of the night. The problem is things start to jump out at you in the middle of the night. you're in an unfamiliar place. You know what I'm talking about? Like your elbow is just like magnetically pulled to the counter. Um, Like the the post of the bed just like sticks its leg out for you while you're walking by. Someone left Legos in a place you didn't think they should be, right? Like you're in an unfamiliar place. Here's the problem when you're walking in an unfamiliar place in the dark. You don't know where anything is and you cannot see where you're going. Two problems in the dark. Walking around in the dark, you have two problems. You can't see where you're going, and you don't know where anything is. This passage of scripture says there's a moment where we are met with hope, and that moment is that we are walking around in darkness. You, apart from Christ, are born into darkness. That's what verse 2 tells us. This moment where hope intersects us, we are walking around in darkness. And the problem with walking around in the dark is that you cannot see where you're going and you do not know where anything is. You and I were all born into sin. We were, Romans tells us, born into the line of Adam, born into sin, which means that naturally you and I are walking around in darkness. Sin is blinding. Sin keeps us from being able to see things as they really are. Maybe you can relate to this in your own life. Maybe you can look back in your life and think of a time where you were caught in sin. Maybe because of your circumstances, maybe because of something you've been struggling with since childhood, but there was a sin in your life. Maybe let's take pride, for instance. There's a sin in your life that's caused you to not be able to see things as they really are. Pride will do this to us. Pride causing us to have an elevated view of self 
so that we think everybody thinks things are going well. We think this shirt looks good when we walk outside. Did that ever happen to anybody? That's, I've, I've been married for almost eight months now. That's one great thing about having a wife, okay? Your, your pride might say things look good before you walk out the door, but your wife will not. You know, like she'll be honest with you. Maybe you can experience that. But you, sin, like pride, sin keeps us from being able to see things as they actually are. Sin blinds us. It causes us to believe things that are actually not true. Sin keeps us from being able to see things rightly. We can see this play out in our culture as well. We're living in a culture that has been blinded by sin. That's why our culture celebrates that which should be disregarded. It's why down is up and wrong is right in our culture. Why the things that we see praised and lifted up in our culture are things that we know are wrong, that go against God's word. The reason isn't because people like had a board meeting 20 years ago and decided these were the things they were gonna push. It's because we've been blinded by our sin. Sin causes us to be unable to see things as they really are. And so our culture is blinded. Our culture praises that which should be pushed away. Lifts up the things that we know are killing our culture and maybe our hearts and souls from the inside out. Sin causes us to be drawn in desire for things that will actually kill us in the end. Sin makes that which is poisonous to our heart look enticing. One pastor said, all of Satan's apples have worms. He said, I'm not saying that they don't look good on the outside. I'm not, I'm not saying they don't look attractive. I'm not saying that sin, that temptation doesn't look good. If temptation didn't look good, no one would do it. All of Satan's apples though, even though they look good, even though it's enticing, they actually have worms. They're rotten on the inside. Sin keeps us from seeing things as they really are. We need hope because we cannot see without the light of the gospel. We need hope because we are walking around in darkness. Walking around in darkness means that we're born into sin, but it also means that we live without Christ, apart from Christ, we live with no direction and no purpose. We live with no direction and no purpose. It's not only the case that when you're walking around in the dark that you can't see things for how they really are. It is also the case that you can't see the direction in which you're going. The reason you stub your toe on the bedpost is because you couldn't see where you were going. Walking around in darkness means that we live without direction or without purpose. And the lie that sin will tell you, unfortunately, it's the lie that many in our culture are telling us today as well, is that you can find purpose and direction if you'll look within. If you'll follow your heart, if you'll search your feelings, if you'll do the thing that seems right to you, if you'll follow after your strongest desires or your loudest thoughts, then you'll have purpose in life. That will give you a direction in your life. The problem is, if we could just search our feelings and follow that to find a direction, then we wouldn't be admitting we're walking in darkness to begin with. What darkness does is it convinces us that we can find purpose and direction within. Tricks us into believing that the lights are really on when we're actually walking in darkness. We need hope because we cannot find any purpose, any direction apart from Christ. So we all need hope because we're born into darkness. But verses four and five tell us we all need hope because we are all in a state of war. I'm gonna read verses four and five again. It says, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This is warrior language. It's battle language. The, the figurative language that's used here, the picture that the author is painting is that of war, of battle. 
The reality is that each and every one of us is in a war for our souls. Each and every one of us is in a battle for our spiritual lives. And this text reminds us that we are walking in darkness, that we need hope because we are in a state of war. When this text talks about the yoke, this is a picture that's being painted. It's an illustration that's being used. It's wartime language for people who have been enslaved and are forced to do labor for one who has conquered them. What's actually playing out in this original text, what's happening on the surface here, is that the people of Israel are in exile, they're being conquered by Babylon, and so they, be, they have literally had yokes placed on them, actual instruments, so that they would be forced to do labor as those who were enslaved. That's the, that's the image that's playing out here. We need hope because we are in a state of war and our enemy will enslave us if we aren't careful. Romans tells us that we are slaves to sin. And unfortunately, many of us have been playing around with sin. We've been thinking that it's not that big a deal. We've been thinking, well, it hasn't blown up in my face so far. We've believed the lie that it's not quite as serious as people make it out to be. We've believed the lie that we have it under control. And you've been playing with fire, you've been getting as close as you can get, you've been thinking that it's not a big deal and you can continue to play around with your sin and all the while it's been chaining you up. All the while it's been enslaving you. All the while it's been taking you further than you would ever thought, think that you could go. It's been dragging you deeper than you ever imagined you could be. And it's been putting chains on things that you believe to be free. Sin will tell you a lie and say that it's dragging you towards satisfaction when it's actually dragging you towards slavery. Sin will tell you a lie and say that if you'll follow your desires, if you'll follow after your loudest thoughts, your strongest emotions, your deepest feelings, That's where you'll find happiness. That's where you'll find satisfaction. That's where you'll find freedom. But the enemy is a liar. Sin is not leading you into satisfaction. Sin is leading you into bondage. The very thing that you think will liberate you, that's actually what will put you into chains. We have to realize, guys, if we're going to be serious about sin, if we're going to be serious about understanding the hope that we actually have at Christmas, we have to get a clear picture of the situation we're actually faced with. We are walking around in darkness because we're born into sin and because we are in a state of war. Here's what we have to understand this morning. We cannot free ourselves. Man, I'm just going to be honest with you guys this morning. I cannot free myself. You, if you are in sin this morning, you are a slave to your sin. Sin causes you to be a slave to your passions and to your desires. It's not freeing. It's not liberating. It's actually putting you in bondage. And if you are not careful, even as a Christian, you will believe the lie that you can break the chains of the bondage of your sin if you'll just try a little harder. If you could just be a little better of a person, if you could just read your Bible a little more, show up to church a little more often, be a little bit better when it comes to being a neighbor, if you could just do a little bit more, then you can finally break the bondage of your sin and find freedom. What we see in this text is we are in need of hope because we cannot free ourselves. No matter how strong I think I am or how righteous I think I am, I cannot break the bondage of sin in and of my own strength. I can't do it on my own. We cannot free ourselves, and so we need hope. We're in a state of war, and so this text shows us that through this imagery of the yoke of enslavement to sin, but it also talks about the rod of the oppressor. The rod of the oppressor. It would it, Just an instrument that an enemy, that a conquering enemy would use to keep rebels in line. And the reality for each and every one of us this morning is we are facing an enemy 
with a plan to destroy you. You are facing an enemy, sin, Satan, the devil. You are facing an enemy with a plan to destroy you. And so many of us do not have a plan to defend ourselves. You have an enemy with a plan to destroy you, with a plan to enslave you, with a plan to draw you in and entice you in with temptation. You have an enemy with a plan to destroy you. So you need a plan to defend yourself. The enemy wants simply to steal, kill, and destroy your life. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill your love for God. He wants to destroy your life and your family. This is what sin will do. Sin will always steal, kill, and destroy. And if you do not wake up this morning and realize that you need hope, that you need somebody who can do something about an enemy that you cannot defend yourself against, that you need somebody to turn the lights on in your dark situation, that you need somebody to break the chains of your sin that you can't break on your own. If you don't wake up this morning and realize that you need hope, then you will continue to walk around in darkness. If you don't wake up this morning and realize what God's trying to say to you from his word today, that you need hope, then you'll think you can win the victory in your own strength and you'll continue to be defeated time after time after time. See, we cannot win the victory for ourselves, so we need hope. And some of you might feel exactly how the people of Israel felt when they first read this passage of scripture thousands of years ago. When this prophecy was first delivered to God's people, they felt completely hopeless. They knew they were in darkness. They knew they were in bondage. And they were convinced that there was no hope. And so I'm so excited to get to move into the part of this passage of scripture and into our time together this morning where we can experience the same good news, the same gospel that the people of Israel first heard of thousands of years ago, the truth that Jesus is our hope. Yes, you are in darkness. Apart from Christ, you're enslaved to your sin. Yes, we in and of ourselves are in a hopeless situation, but praise be to God, Jesus is our hope. The way this text says it is incredibly clear. Jesus is our light in the darkness. Look back at verse two. It says, the people who walked around in darkness, that's you, that's me. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. What is Jesus bringing with him at Advent, at his arrival? What's Jesus bringing with him? He is bringing a great light. He's bringing a great light to drive back our darkness. What this prophecy would have felt like for the people of Israel in this moment when they would have first read it is the same feeling I believe God wants to give some of you this morning. They would have looked at each other and said, God hasn't forgotten us. It's dark, it's difficult, it's painful. We feel broken, we feel lost, but there's hope because God has not forgotten us. Some of you today, you feel broken, you feel pained, you feel left behind, you feel frustrated by the circumstances of your life, you feel overwhelmed by anxiety or depression. Maybe for you, you look around to other people that the holidays are a great time to celebrate, but for you, there's this empty space and you feel hopeless because of the circumstances of your life, because of the sins that you've committed, because of the addiction that you feel like you can't break out of, because of the family situation that feels like it's never gonna change, you feel like you're walking around in darkness. Maybe you've even looked at each other this holiday season and said, has God forgotten us? Are we alone? Maybe you've looked in the mirror or thought to yourself, you know what, I don't know that any of this can ever change. Our original audience, they felt the same exact way. And God spoke this word to them to say, I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten you. Jesus is our hope because Jesus is our light. 
If we can imagine ourselves walking around that unfamiliar dark room, getting up in the middle of the night, walking around in a place we don't know, what hope really means is that Jesus has turned the lights on. Jesus has turned the lights on. Jesus helps us to see things as they really are and to get a clear direction for where we are supposed to go. He gives us a clear view of how things really are and a clear direction of where we're supposed to be going. Jesus turns the lights on. Some of us, we've been groping around in the dark looking for satisfaction, looking for fulfillment, looking for direction, and you grabbed a hold of a counter or of a bedpost and you thought that you'd find satisfaction in what you could find yourself, you believed the lie that that apple was good and ripe, you've deceived yourself or allowed sin to deceive you into believing that you had found a clear path on your own. Today, God is saying you can stop wandering around in the dark You can stop trusting your instincts or your strongest desires because if you'll let him, Jesus will turn the lights on for you today. See, we can know, we can have this strategy to defend ourselves in our state of war. We can know the direction to walk in. We can know and see things as they really are, not because we suddenly become the wisest people on the planet, not because when Jesus intersects our lives, we suddenly know everything. You can know how things really are and the direction that God's called you to walk into because God has turned the lights on for you in his word. Because in the midst of our darkness, God has shown a great light. First, in what we celebrate today, in the first coming of Jesus, in his advent, in his arrival, but also in the revelation of Jesus through the scriptures. Jesus has turned the lights on for you. Light drives back darkness. That's what it does. And if today you feel like you're in the midst of a dark situation, there's a, there's a circumstance in your life when it feels like Darkness has just completely enveloped your life. Let me just ask you, have you been shining the light of the gospel into that dark place? Maybe there's a situation in your life, maybe it's in your neighborhood, maybe it's with your family, maybe it's at your workplace. And you've been throwing your hopes, your hands up in hopelessness, in desperation. Man, there's, what could ever change this? The only thing that can drive back darkness is light. Martin Luther King Jr. said he had given up on hate because it was too great a burden to bear. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Some of you have thought that what God's called you to do is drive back the darkness in your life with more darkness, with more hate, with more division, with more anger, with more frustration. Somehow that as culture warriors, our responsibility is to fight fire with fire. That's not our responsibility at all. Darkness cannot drive back darkness. Only light can do that. If you want to see change in your life, in your neighborhood, in your family, in the culture around us, you will not see change by fighting darkness with darkness. You'll only see change by letting the light of the gospel drive back the darkness in your life. What are the parts of your life that you need to expose to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What are the dark places in your family, in your workplace, in your own heart that you need to expose to the light of God's word? Man, we have hope in Jesus because Jesus is our light. But lastly, I want you to see that we have hope in Jesus because Jesus ends the war. Jesus ends the war. Man, what good news that in his coming, Jesus has broken the yoke of our slavery. Jesus has shattered the rod of our enemy. Jesus has taken the garments that were once bloodied by war. He has rolled them up and thrown them into the fire because when Jesus comes, he has come to end the war once and for all. Jesus came first at Christmas as a baby to live a perfect life to die the death that you deserve, and to put death in the ground forever. He's gone in victory, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and when he comes again, our hope 
will cease to be in something that is not here fully yet. Our faith will be made sight. And when Jesus comes again, he's going to take us back with him so that where he is, there we may be also. The victory that we experience here in this life, in part in Jesus, we will experience fully and completely and eternally when he comes again. Your hope, it's not in something that you have to believe in, hoping that it's gonna work out your way. If your hope is in Jesus, it's as sure as he is. Jesus has not forgotten you. He is not leaving you in darkness. Those who are in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus is coming again to take you with him. Final victory is found in the advent in Jesus coming again. Let's finish this morning in verse 6. It says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hope has a name, and it's Wonderful Counselor. Hope has a name, and it is Mighty God. Hope has a name and it is everlasting father. Hope has a name and it's prince of peace. And today, if you'll place your faith in him for you in the midst of your darkness, hope has a name and his name is Jesus. I just wanna challenge you this morning as we close. Stop groping around in the dark, hoping to find satisfaction or direction in anything else. Stop looking within for your purpose. You'll never find it there. Place your hope in Jesus and find the hope that you were created for. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you that we can find our hope in you. And we confess this morning, God, we can find it in you and in you alone. So God, give us the courage and the strength to stop looking elsewhere, to stop trying to find hope in our culture, in ourselves, in the temporary and fleeting satisfactions of this world. God, help us to stop groping around in the dark trying to find some satisfaction or fulfillment or direction there. God, give us the clarity of mind and sight to find our hope in you and you alone. Jesus, we thank you that you've not left us in darkness, but that we who are found in darkness can see a great light. God, for those who are in this room or maybe even those who we love and care about and are connected to who aren't in this room with us today, God, who have never experienced the hope of the gospel, God, I pray today would be the day of salvation. If anyone's here in this room today, God, they've never placed their faith in you, never found hope in you, I pray they'd do it today. Grab Ashley out in the lobby, talk to a host team member, fill out a connect card. God, give them the courage to take that step and find their hope in you even now. God, for those in our lives who need that hope, what better time could there be than Christmas to shine the light of the gospel into the dark places of our lives? God, give us the faith and the courage to say yes to what you're calling us into. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, amen.